Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about hype and reality today. And I thought I would start with hype. Um, on, on the left, we have Andrew Eng saying, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. That's profound if it were true. Um, and it was written in Harvard Business Review, so some people must think that's a credible source. But I think it's a little bit exaggerated. I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, if it were true, then what Sundar says on the right, CEO of Google, would also be true. Um, AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than, I don't know, electricity or fire. Maybe someday that will actually be true. Right now, I would prefer to keep electricity and fire and give up on AI for a little while. <coughs> when people hype AI, it has consequences. One consequence is people waste a lot of money. Um, here's an example. Facebook got very excited about the promise of deep learning and decided they were going to build the best intelligent assistant ever. It was going to put Siri to shame. You're going to be able to ask anybody, or I mean, ask anybody was going to be able to ask essentially anything. Whatever custom request you might have, they rolled it out, um, wired uh, in many other journals, immediate, uh, obediently went along with it, and they wrote about how this was going to be a bold answer to Siri. They had a limited release in California. How did it actually work? There were people behind it. So there was no actual AI in the original version of Facebook M. It was a data play. The notion was we will collect all of this data, which is going to be expensive because they were going to have to have humans actually fulfilling all these requests. Um, and then we will use that data. We'll feed it into deep learning, and we will get our intelligent assistant. Three years later, they gave up. I don't know the numbers. Nobody disclosed how much they invested. But I think that they overestimated what deep learning could do, and it was a wasted investment. Um, here's another example. Um, in this very room, I believe, Jeff Hinton said, we should stop tra trading radiologists right now. It's completely obvious that within five years, deep learning is going to be better than radiologists. If you work as a radiologist, you're like a coyote already over the edge of the cliff who hasn't yet looked down. Hinton's, of course, the best known person in machine learning. A lot of people took this seriously. What we have right now is actually a shortage of radiologists. 400 startups that are working on radiology, that's an estimate from Hugh Harvey, and no actual radiologists that are being replaced. Instead, the most recent data suggests that what we really want are human-in-the-loop hybrids. So it's not that AI or deep learning isn't helping with radiology. It is. But it's not to the point where you can replace a radiologist because there's still lots of things beyond just what's in the image. Deep learning is really good at the image, but it's not necessarily good, as we heard in a talk earlier, um, at reading electronic health records that are English in, in you know, doctorese. Um, so uh, here we have something that might have real consequence on society. We might actually wind up with not enough radiologists because people are, I think, uh, prematurely enthusiastic about the promise. No another example, um, you know, Tesla is going around saying the driverless cars might be here. Um, next year, going from point A to point B, that leads some people to trust the vehicle. Um, I don't think that they should yet. Um, here's just going across the street from point A to point B in a fully automated driverless car. <gasps> oh my God. So, um, you know, there's still a few bugs in the system. Fully automated driverless cars will come someday, but talking about them as if they're here right now may be misleading. Um, <coughs> There's nothing new about hype in AI. Here's 2015, Jan LeCun saying that um, we'd suit, well, Wired said deep learning will soon give us super smart robots. And Jan LeCun kind of um, played along <coughs> with that and said, you know, perception in robots is, is a really growing area. Well, it's a few years later. We don't have Rosie the robot. We still don't have, I don't even know if Rosie the robot's super smart, but reasonably smart robots that could do what humans could do. Instead, we're still basically stuck with Roomba. There are new versions of Roomba that are a little bit better than the old ones can actually do a little bit of navigation. But that's where we are. The super smart robots that Wired said you know, would soon be here aren't actually here yet. Um, and then I'm not going to talk too much about this, but probably a lot of people saw a tweet that I had um, about solving a Rubik's Cube earlier this week um, with OpenAI. And I had a number of criticisms. You can um, uh, refer to the tweet to see them. But fundamentally, I don't think it was as general a solution as, as was pitched. There are also some intellectual issues, and, and, and you can read about it on Twitter. Um, so the question is, why are we where we are? So there's been so much hype about deep learning, and yet it hasn't really replaced radiology yet. We don't really have chatbots. That's what the Facebook M thing was supposed to be. It's pretty hard to build reliable driverless cars. It's easy to build a demo, but it's hard to get them to be reliable. And it's <coughs> been hard to build robust robots. You know, nobody has a version of Rosie the robot that you can buy at any price. Why? 
And at the same time, there's been huge progress in some areas, like chess, poker, and Go. Why, why that progress and yet um, such failures in the real world? I think the only way to recognize this disconnect is to recognize this. Deep learning is not magic. It's just a statistical technique with specific strengths and weaknesses, just like any other statistical technique. Requiring, or using it well, rather, requires understanding both, understanding the strengths and the weaknesses, and finding where you can apply it and where you can't. Um, it's good at a lot of things. It's better, in fact, than anything else that's yet been invented. Pedro and I had an interesting discussion about how much better um, it is than, than some related algorithms. Um, but it is better um, for things like face recognition, object recognition, speech recognition, <coughs> recognizing patterns in board games. And even for radiology, it's better um, as a technique than, than we've had before. It's just not quite um, all the way there yet. Um, but deep learning is not as deep as, as the name suggests. The, deep, the word deep makes you think like conceptually deep, like in your philosophy class. But that's not what it means. It just means there's a lot of layers in a neural network. It's just a technical term. Um, so you know, it's how many layers you have in a neural network like this. And if you have a lot of them, it becomes easier to tell the difference. This example is fictional, but the next ones won't be. Um, it makes it easier to tell the difference between Tiger Woods and a golf ball. You have training examples. They're labeled. The system creates parameters. If you have more layers, there's more opportunity to create these intermediate um, <coughs> things, uh, hidden layers, um, intermediate combinations of features. And it's basically big data in and, concept, um, and uh, complex statistical correlations out. But what I'm telling you is that the word deep doesn't tell you about conceptual depth. So here's an example. You can train, and it might be a little small, I don't know. Um, but you, you can train a deep <coughs> network on a bunch of pictures of elephants. And then you showed another picture of elephants that looks pretty much like the ones it's already seen. The deep network will be able to <coughs> correctly guess that that's an elephant. But what is it relying on? Is it relying on a deep conceptual understanding of what an elephant is in terms of <coughs> having a trunk and um, you know, living in a particular environment and having big ears and, and so forth? Well, not really. What it's mostly relying on, on is texture. So if I take away that texture um, and silhouette the elephant, then the system says that it's a person. How many people here think that that is, in fact, a person on the right? OK, so there are no deep learning systems attending my talk yet. Um, here's another example. Um, here, here is a thing <coughs> that a deep learning system says with great confidence is a snowplow. Why is it saying that when it's actually an overturned school bus? It's because it has the texture of most of the pictures that it's been trained on that are snowplows. So it's really not a deep inference, and it's, in fact, an incorrect one in this case. Here, here's another one. Some, uh, I think grad students at MIT created baseballs. I guess there are probably some Toronto Raptor fans here who will recognize that as a baseball. And they put some foam on it. And the deep learning system, because it's driven so much by texture, um, said that it was an espresso. <laughs> um, Pedro and I were ta talking about a version of this one a minute ago. You see a, you, a banana, and the deep learning system recognizes it. Now you put a psychedelic picture of a toaster next to it, and it thinks that that picture at the bottom is a picture of a toaster. And in fact, it can't even represent a more subtle notion like a banana with a psychedelic toaster uh, sticker next to it. Um, and these problems persist. Some of those are old, some are new. Um, here's one from a week ago by a venture capitalist known to many people in this room, Benedict Evans from A16Z. And he posted um, this very reasonably. He said, this is why we train autonomous cars in San Francisco. And he showed an example of a car that is outside the training set um, of typical cars, because there's a bunch of stickers or paintings on it I can't quite tell. Um, and David Hoff, a friend of mine who works at, at Google, um, thought it would be fun to test that picture. Um, and here's what he got. <laughs> So the first reality is that deep learning works best in a regime of big data and worse with unusual cases. So you got your fat tail on the left. Deep learning usually works for that. If your problem is one that is all in the fat tail and you don't care about the outlier cases, go ahead and use deep learning. If all you're trying to do is recommend books, and if you like a book by Pedro, maybe you'll like a book by me. You know, hopefully that turns out for the best and you like it. But if you like Pedro's book and you didn't like mine, too bad. You only wasted $30 and you'll live. Um, however, if the things in the right tail matter, then it's not such a good technique. So things in the, the tail of small data, big learning is not very good at it. So when um, a car crashes into, uh, when an automatic car crashes into an um, a emergency vehicle that's stopped on a highway, it's probably because there isn't a lot of data there, but that's something that matters a lot. 
Um, so going back to Andrew Eng's quote, understanding that deep learning is not magic, here, here's a comparison. So he says if a typical person um, can do something <coughs> in a second of thought, we can probably automate it. And what I say is if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we, and we can gather an enormous amount of data, which keeps us in the fat tail, we have a fighting chance so long as the training data uh, sorry, the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data. If they are, you're out in that long tail and you're in trouble. Um, and the domain doesn't change too much over time. If the domain changes over time, you again wind up um, in that long tail and you're in trouble. So that's a way of thinking about what deep learning can and can't do. And if you have a problem where you have unusual cases, it's not necessarily the technique for you. Meanwhile, there are other problems too, like bias has been really difficult to remove. So, you know, 2015, we, we saw um, Google calling some African Americans gorillas, and, and they patched that up. And then in 2017, there was another example where you typed in babies into Google Images, um, and you got all white people, and they patched that up. And in 2019, just a few days ago, I did another example, which was, um, I can't quite see it from here, but it was something like um, grandmother and, and granddaughter or something like that. So, like, you can patch these problems up one at a time, but it's like whack-a-mole. There's not a general solution here. Um, to the problem of bias in AI. Uh, uh, Mariza, I can't quite say her name, um, you know, gave us another set of examples. They, they, they're ubiquitous. People put band-aids on them, but until the systems actually understand notions like gender, culture, um, and so forth, until they have a deep understanding of the social norms that we're trying to achieve and so forth, just adding one statistical band-aid here is not going to be a general solution to the problem. Um, clicker is stopped. There we go. Um, so um, the, the core issue in the book that Ernie Davis and I just wrote is really about trust. And the way that we put it in a New York Times op-ed is artificial intelligence has a trust problem. We're relying on AI more and more, but it hasn't yet earned our confidence. The second part of the book, and you all get a free copy, so I'm not trying to sell you the book, um, <coughs> but <coughs> maybe you can read it, um, it, is about insights from cognitive science. What are we going to do about these problems? One thing I think we should stop doing is looking for silver bullets. So <coughs> deep learning, at its best, is good at perception. I already showed, I went into its sweet spot, that's perception. I didn't even go into language, which is not a sweet spot. Even there, there are problems. But let's say it's a pretty decent tool for perception. That doesn't mean that it's an appropriate tool for common sense, for planning, for analogy, for language, for reasoning, and so forth. Um, some of you may have seen my critical appraisal of deep learning I had a year ago. It was widely taken to be an argument that we should drop deep learning, but it was very carefully stated not to be that, and this is a quote from it. Despite all the problems I have sketched, I don't think we need to abandon deep learning. Rather, we need to reconceptualize it, not as a universal solvent, but simply as one tool among many, a power screwdriver in a world in which we also need hammers, wrenches, and pliers, and so forth. Um, second is deep learning has to start with common sense. So we do not want to build robots that learn from trial and error which side of a tree limb to cut down. You don't want to try this 100,000 times and cut down the wrong side. Another example, um, once in a while someone will be able to identify what this is. It's a yarn feeder. The point is to keep the ball of yarn inside the, the ball and have the string come down. As soon as we, we have enough common sense and understanding of the causal nature of the world that once we see one example, we can now recognize another, even if it's pixel for pixel, um, totally different and but ugly. That's what common sense is about. Um, common sense is also if, if you are a cleaning robot, you do not want to spread the stuff on the right around. But uh, current ro Roombas actually have a lot of trouble with that. Um, there's, there's a word for it. It's called a poopocalypse. And it's actually happened more than once. <laughs> Third example, not as amusing, but um, we have notions of space and time and causality. If we see a greater, we understand what the pieces are for. We don't just identify it. We understand why there's a handle and why there's holes. And I have a sort of silly video and I need to make a better one. But this is my greater. It has six sides on it. And you can figure out why this one has six and why, why that might be more useful than four and so forth. That's what common sense is about. Um, we need to build that into our systems. The third thing is learning is not just about big data and number crunching. It's also about things like learning by exploring the world in relation to your own body, by doing problem solving and having an intuitive understanding of how the world works. So this is my daughter, um, I guess about a year ago. She has a chair. Um, we're sitting at Whole Foods in Vancouver, and she decides that she wants to climb through it. She's not doing this by imitation. I would never fit through, even, even before my book tour, in which I gained I don't know how many pounds. I would not be able to do this. She's not imitating um, what I did um, or what her brother did. She just decides this is an interesting goal. 
Um, this is a totally different paradigm from give me a bunch of labeled examples and I will um, extend the, those category labels to something else. This is, I wonder if I can do this and how. And she actually gets stuck. <laughs> but she figures it out and then she's through, right? This is the kind of learning we want our AI systems to be able to do. Um, fourth lesson is common sense probably starts with at least some innate basis. So I don't think we want to hand wire our entire common sense database the way that Doug Lennett tried to do with the psych system, but we can't learn it all either. We need to start somewhere. And developmental psychology shows us that children seem to be born with some basic concepts, understanding things like space and time and object. This is Liz Belke at Harvard. I don't think I have time to read the whole quote, but you can find it later. Um, I have argued that human beings are born with a whole bunch of different innate things, but not that many, like 10. This is my kind of opening bid, I guess you could say. Uh, some of them are very specific technical things that basically boil down to saying that we have a kind of algebra in our head. Um, and that's taken from an earlier book of mine, The Algebraic Mind. Um, and some of them are the kinds of things that Spelke's talking about, like sets and locations and paths and so forth, um, causality. One of them is translational invariance, which is actually the driver behind deep learning, um, is uh, convolutional networks are actually a way of innately having um, uh, translational invariance. Um, what I'm saying is we don't just need translational invariance, we need a somewhat richer basis and then we'll be able to do well. Do Nobody ever believes that, however, the human children have stuff innately, so I like to show them videos of a baby ibex. Baby ibex, a few hours after its birth, could climb down a side of a mountain. That's innateness, right? It must have a built-in visual system that can understand three-dimensional objects in the world and, and relate them to its own body. Um, and uh, in way of fairness and comparison, here, here's the alternative technologies of where it's at. Everything here was tested in simulation. Um, um, fifth, what we really need is a compromise between two traditions. We can't get to AI we can trust um, by relying on deep learning all, uh, alone. We're going to have to take some elements from classical AI. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to do this quickly. But classical AI, that represents things in terms of a mental algebra. Um, Jeff Hinton represents the deep learning tradition. His great-great-grandfather actually represents the symbolic tradition. It doesn't have to be binary. It doesn't have to be that either Jeff is right or his great-grandfather -grand is right. We should really be looking for a, a compromise. Um, did I just get an extra minute as a bonus? Um, well, cool then. Um, so, so Hinton's arguments fundamentally boil down, and you can watch um, uh, this talk that he gives at the G7. Um, uh, you can find the tweet online. Hinton, Hinton's arguments against symbols basically boil down to they're not working very well right now. Deep learning is crushing symbols right now. And deep learning is crushing symbols right now, crushing symbol manipulation. But take yourself back to 2010, and people were making exactly that argument about deep learning. They were saying, abandon deep learning, support vector machines are much better, they're much more efficient. Nobody's ever shown deep learning doing anything um, in the real world. And then it turned out that you get some GPUs, you get more data, you make a couple of, of tricks like ReLUs, and suddenly it's changed the world. Well, maybe simple manipulation's time hasn't come yet. Um, and for that matter, maybe what we really want are hybrids, which is something that, that Pedro thinks about a lot. Um, I think we need to be thinking about hybrid models. Um, it's fallacious to assume that if you have two tools that they're necessarily in a subset relationship. So Jeff has made the argument that, that um, Symbol manipulation is like a gasoline engine, and deep learning is like an electric engine, and we can just get rid of the gasoline engine. But there are lots of places where multiple tools coexist. I could give you many examples. Hammers and screwdrivers, x-rays and stethoscopes, airplanes and helicopters, and so forth. Um, contrary to what Hinton implies, the quest for artificial general intelligence does not have to be zero sum. Um, what we need is hy hybrid vigor. AlphaGo is an example of this. It's deep learning plus something called Monte Carlo tree search. Um, OpenAI's Rubik's Cube is actually a hybrid model, even though it's build that isn't built that way. That's actually why I got upset. Um, Facebook had a new language model released yesterday. It's a hybrid model. They're actually becoming more and more popular. This is the wave of the future. Not to um, push away one or the other tradition, but to bring them together. So to recap, um, in the event of a robot attack, don't, you, know, you really shouldn't be so worried. Um, somebody just asked me to comment on the Terminator for BBC. Uh, um, in the event of a robot attack, close the door. Or if that doesn't work, if things get really rough, lock the door. There is no robot in the world right now that can unlock sticky doors. <laughs> hide behind a bus, dress like a bus, hide behind a shiny toaster. <laughs> Keep a pack of psychedelic stickers handy, a giant fan, something that's slimy or sticky. And if that doesn't work, just talk in a noisy room with a foreign accent. They'll never understand you. 
And if all else fails, climb some stairs or maybe a tree. You'll be good. Um, two, deep learning is definitely a better ladder. You know, for speech recognition, it's, it's a much better tool. Um, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. AGI is still about as far away as, the, as, as it ever was. It's still a moonshot. Um, we still don't have systems that can do real natural language understanding, that can understand a conversation or a lecture delivered at a speedy clip. Um, deep learning is ultimately no, under, no substitute for deep understanding. We just haven't solved the comprehension part of, of uh, language and, and AI yet. Um, if we want to build machines that are as smart as people, we should start by studying small people. And just a couple more things. Um, I want to warn you that we're living in a special dangerous moment in history. Um, in the past, we had no AI. We trusted nothing to AI. In the future, we'll have powerful AI that we can actually trust, that actually does have deep comprehension, can maintain our values. It's going to be fabulous. It's going to help with climate change and cancer and understanding the brain. Right now, we have mediocre AI, I think it would look like that from a historical perspective. They put correlation before, before comprehension, and we've entrusted too much to it. Um, so we entrust our news feeds to it, our jobs sometimes, we interview things, our prison sentences, our, our medical decisions. And right now, the reach of deep learning um, and of AI more generally often exceeds its grasp. We can't trust deep learning alone. It's just not realistic to think that we will be able to um, stuff AI back into Pandora's box now. Now that it's outside the box, we have to push the field forward. Until we have deep comprehension to go alongside of deep learning, we're not going to have AI that we can trust. And we're not going to be able to build reliable real world versions of Rosie the Robot and so forth, which bl brings me to a very brief plug for my new company, um, Robust AI. We're only five months old. I can't tell you that much about what we're doing yet, and of course, we're still working it out. Mostly what we have done is to assemble a fantastic team that I have depicted there. What we're trying to do is to build the world's first industrial grade cognitive engine, and that means a hybrid deep comprehension uh, driven platform to allow robots to act intelligently in a dynamic, open-ended, uh, flexible real world. And we are hiring, and get in touch if you're interested. And I thank you very much. So, and a quote. There's a quote, quote there for you I forgot to read. The real risk is not super intelligent. It's idiot savants with power, such as autonomous weapons that could target people with no values to constrain them. Thank you very much.